Well, good morning. morning. Welcome. Let us worship God together today. That's our reason for being here and why we're sitting here. So open your heart to Him, and as we begin to sing in a moment, just say, Lord, I want you to fill me up with your presence and your spirit, work in my life, make me usable in the lives of others. So let us begin by praying. We'll ask God to have his way. You remain seated until we've finished the prayer, and then we'll stand and sing our first hymn song. We've got to make adjustments here. My fault. Is that better? Is that any good? One, two, three. Okay, got it. Is the other one working? All right. We just take care of business up here. It's easier to handle. Got it done. All right, let us pray. Bow your heads with me. Father, looking back over the week, we're thankful for your faithfulness to us, your walk with us, your continued grace to our lives, and your working in each one of us, your will, that we might live and glorify you in every circumstance and in every situation. So our prayer today, Lord, is that you will come among us that you'll work in the life of each one represented here, that you'll bless every family that's coming to worship, binding them together in your gospel power and strength. And we pray, Lord, that you will continue to guide our steps so that when we leave this place, having celebrated your grace, your glorious reality, we might be able to witness to others in such a way that the gospel will be heard, believed, and acted upon and your name will be glorified, praised. So bless your people. Have your way in every man, every woman, every young person, every child. Your name be exalted and glorified. Jesus' name be lifted up. We give you praise for all that you are and all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Stand with us. Let's.
a test. <laughs> Short again, just a little, but that's okay. <laughs> Keep me in line. <coughs> said it before I said it again. It's always such a privilege to read the Word of God. It's just such a privilege. We are a privileged people, aren't we? <laughs> Listen as though you've never, ever heard this before. Pretend you've never heard any of the words we're reading. <coughs> now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs you do unless God is with him. <coughs> Jesus answered him, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, Well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, Truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For your scriptures. Mm -hmm. Continuing in John 3, verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come to the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are For everyone who does, not, who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is, what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Let's do this. Hit it. Stand and sing.
You may be seated. We're going to pray as we do each Sunday, each day in this in this place. We come together. Prayer is part of what we do centrally. And acknowledging there are many needs and lots of hurting people who need the touch of Jesus, and the healing power of God. So we're definitely praying. There's a lot of names on the prayer sheet, so remember to take one with you and uh, get acquainted with those people as you pray their names to the Lord. It's effective work, and it's a very important ministry of love. Before we pray, I'm going to put two things together. I'm going to read my text one more time so we can come to it after we greet one another. And then I'm going to pray. So let me read this text. It's a, it's a short one, as you probably already noticed. John 3 and 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So it is with everyone who is born with the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I look across this room today once again, as we've done so many times, and recognize the presence, and the worship of people who haven't felt good at times, gone through some very hard physical things, challenging with spiritual things and supply of need and all of that, every kind of of circumstance and situations in the lives of this group of people, reflecting and expressing the reality of the body of Christ as a whole. And our prayer today, O Lord, is that you will open your word to each one of us, that you will place your anointing upon it and within it and make it a living word to the mind and heart of the child of God who's receiving it who's bowing before the living God and trusting in Him to bring an answer, a supply, a way of provision to each one of us. Lead us today in this service, Lord, as we continue. Let us find our step in it so that we can be in step with the Holy Spirit. And anoint us, Lord, as we pray for people or we talk to people through the Word of God or we pause for a moment to wait on what the Spirit wants to do. We submit to you, Lord. You are the God who knows us on the inside, every need, everything in us, He knows. And so we come today with thankful hearts that not only does He know, but we have the potential and the possibility of hearing what He shares and brings to us for wholeness and peace. Bless your people, Lord. Bless us together as we open our hearts and look up to the God who's glorious and mighty, whom we love with all of our heart, having been loved by him. In Jesus, the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Why don't you stand, greet someone nearby, and we'll come and go right to the Word. We're finished.
The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, and you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Every once in a while in my grown-up life, during the years when I've pastored all these years, I've often enjoyed getting to texts like this one. And getting a look at, in this text, this evidence of God's presence that is referred to as the wind. One, one refer reference to it for sure. And I'll give you the other two in just a minute. And I like the King James Version, the wind bloweth. You like that? We know that. We can hang with it. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And I have to go find something to figure out what that is when I first started preaching any of those words. But cannot tell whether, whence it comes and whither it goes, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And they got us right at the end where we could follow along, hopefully. To everyone who'd been brought up in a Jewish tradition, it's natural, it's almost inevitable to have these names, to identify the wind and the wind thus to identify a people who have been redeemed by he who comes and goes, working in our life. So the Jew would automatically, it seems, almost inevitably compare the Spirit of God with the wind. In the Hebrew tongue, the same term was used for both. Most of you heard this, taught this, worked with this. Ruach. Was that guttural enough? I'm trying to give you a good guttural uh, deal with the wind here, which is what we're talking about. The Ruach stood, in fact, for three things. It meant breath. That's the breath you're breathing and I'm breathing. How often does God start that up? Well, I just thought I'd lay that out there, see if we could think about it in a minute. When, how long does it take God to get up in the daytime and go start the motor? Keeping, no, it's a non-ceasing reality. It is here, the wind is blowing. It may not tell it's blowing, it's blowing with such smooth, precise littleness. But once it started in your life, once the breath of God came, God's been watching over you, not always certainly as the redeemed child of God we want you to be and He wants you to be, but as one who's been redeemed and begun in Christ Jesus toward home. In the Hebrew tongue, ruach stood for breath, the breath of life. And it meant also the desert wind. I understand the desert wind can get mighty hot even. But the desert wind is blowing, tearing violently across the land with primal energy and elemental force, and it, and it meant, it meant the Spirit of God. The 
Spirit of God, the breath of God, life of God, coming to us as His. He bursts into history as the Holy Spirit and takes possession of the lives of men. See, it's, it's not us that, that go and get redeemed. It's God who comes and redeems us. And we're able to walk with him and follow him and be his in the most beautiful of places and in the crummiest of places because God orders our steps aright. That is for his glory, his benefit. Here was Jesus with Nicodemus. Let me use a little imagination. He was on the Mount of Olives that night. The moon was riding high above Jerusalem. The driven clouds were scudding across the face of the moon. The wind blowing up from the valley was stirring the branches and rustling the leaves of the olive trees. Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus about the work of God in the soul and the new birth. That's what he was talking to him about. How God could take a life that was conscious of failure and emptiness and dissatisfaction and sin and transform it and make it full and strong and vital and victorious. But Nicodemus was not understanding. He wasn't getting it. Everybody aware of that? It was in this overall text. Here is the master in Israel, the theologian ex Impressive and accredited leader, ruler, and he didn't know what to say. He didn't understand inside, outside things. He just didn't get it. Found this kind of talk beyond him, so Jesus took an illustration. Jesus didn't need to search very far to get a good one. And it was there asking to be used, so here he is, crying out to this one he's dealing with. Listen to the wind, Nicodemus. The Spirit of God is just like that. Listen to the wind. You can hear it sound. The night is full of it. Hark to it in the tops of the trees. But where it has come from and where it's going, no man knows. Whoop, there went the Holy Spirit by on a busy errand. Where am I? I'm sitting over here having a Starbucks where it's real easy. Don't have to worry about anything. Just let him take care of it. It doesn't work quite like that, but I want to remind you that the Holy Spirit is always, always at God's command, working his way into lives like yours and mine. We don't live by the flesh. We please God with the life in the Spirit. God makes it possible for us to live this life of the Spirit. Wants us to. Listen to the wind, Nicodemus. Listen to the wind. You can hear its sound. The night is full of it. Hark to it. Over and over, this is reminding him of things all along the way. But where it had come from and where it's going, no man knew. Now, Nicodemus, the Spirit of God, is just like that. Invisible, yet unmistakable. Impalpable, yet full of power. Able to do wonderful things for you if only you'll stand in the path. And turn your face to it and open your life to its influence. Just listen to the wind, Nicodemus. Listen I've tried to see the wind when that little thing in the foyer is turning, that little windmill. I want to see how much breeze is coming. I couldn't, I couldn't get enough juice to make it look like it was blowing at all, but it was starting to turn. I have to admit I touched it to get it going, but I mean, that's, you can do that when you're dealing with these kinds of windmills. Impalpable yet full of power, right here ready to do wonderful things if you'll stand right in the, in the presence of the, of the God who's come to you. Turn your face to him. Open your life to its influence. Just listen to the wind, Nicodemus. Listen to it. What is Jesus saying here to us? 
What is he saying when he says, the wind blows where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof? Giving them an understanding, a little bit of an understanding that there's something going on when this happens. The wind blows. I've got about five or six sections in here and every time I want to start and finish with, the wind blows. We get the movement of life started. The wind bloweth, that bare, simple statement affirms, first of all, the ceaseless action of the Spirit. The ceaseless, ongoing action of the Spirit. There's been activity from God going on here. When you look at the Bible, it's, it's there in the first page. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Lord God brooded over the chaos that was to become a world. That's what the brooding was. Wasn't it going to produce a world? Yeah. Going to produce a world. A different idea to think about and ponder. Chaos that was to become a world. It is there on the last page also. I am the bright and morning star. 22nd chapter, Revelation. I am the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. That's the next verse in the same text. The spirit and the bride say, come, come. Is there on the last page, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And so from the beginning of days to the last syllable of recorded time, wind blows. The Holy Spirit moves through his people. The Holy Spirit liberates those who are embracing him and being embraced by him. The liberation is slow and the tight rope holds everything taut. But one of these days that spirit will do didos with the people that he's at work on and bring them nearer to God than they ever imagined. I like that. In all those times I've thought about the Holy Spirit working, I always wanted to get a, a bite of that. I want to I sit here in that presence. I want to be with God's people when they notice the wind is blowing. Yeah, me too. I'm the bride and morning star, and the Spirit and the bride say, Come. The Spirit of God is at work. Come to Him. And you can hear the psalmist when he cries out, whether shall I go from your spirit? If I ascend into hell, you're there. And he mentions three or four, five, six things that are involved in this process. I can take the wings of the morning or hide in the midnight, but he's there. God never lets go. If God did, he let go. If he did let go of this universe, for an instance, if God withdrew the action of his spirit, the whole complicated structure would disintegrate and fly apart like a shattered mirror into a million fragments. It is the spirit who holds human life together. Human lives are not held together by counseling from men, people. We can do it. We can help. We can't change a heart. And anyone who is at a place where they're willing to have their heart changed, God is ready to change it. And it may not be moving as fast as you want it to, but you just, just get there on the ground and open your heart to Him. Be ready to follow Him. God does not let go. The human life is held together. Never does He cease working. Oh, by the way, didn't you know the wind blows? Started blowing here. Of course, the New Testament goes beyond this. And, and it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Got it moving, got it moving, got it working. The intimacy of the Holy Spirit's presence working in each of us that way. The New Testament says that the one particular point of history, at, this, at, at a one particular point of history, 
there was a sudden new eruption of the Spirit into human life. Can you think about when that might have been? We're looking at the history of the church now, and taking off in the New Testament. We're over into it, the beginning of it, looking at these texts. An eruption of the Spirit into human life. Jesus, in whom the whole power of the divine Spirit had been focused, had died. And risen from the dead in the mightiest of all the Spirit's mighty acts. And now upon the church that called him Lord, these burst the mighty rushing wind of Pentecost. Holy Spirit time. See, as you read through beginning early in the Bible and you end up in the Revelation, you're going to find the Holy Spirit is not far away. He's fully at work. He's changing things. He's offering things. He's blessing things. And Jesus is getting all the glory because his redemption is accomplished. I love that. The mighty rushing wind of Pentecost. We used to always look for the results of that wind. Some of you know backgrounds like mine. We'd go and pray and pray and pray and believe God to pour out His Spirit and we'd yell loud enough we knew He would. Looking back, I appreciate how God treated us because He didn't squash us with too much to handle and He didn't hide anything from us when we were opening our hearts. And He blessed us with the go power needed to live up to what he's calling us to do. This wind blows, sometimes a gentle zephyr, sometimes a, a judgment thunder, sometimes a quiet guiding voice in the hour of meditation, fierce tornado casting down strongholds of the powers of darkness in the name of Christ, always the Spirit of God at work. Fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily here. What was the fullness of the Godhead? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I can't find any more. Got the Spirit, got the Son, got the Father. And when that comes to inhabit you, live in you, you're getting close to what Jesus had in him, but not quite the same. The fullness of that cup that Jesus carried was the cup that was going to do the work of redemption. The wind blows, breaking down those strongholds, darkness. There have been times when we humans have been heard lamenting that God has deserted his creation, left it to us, our confused, corrupt devices right there. Some have even reached the point where they thought, you know, we ought to try Baal. They're doing it. The false gods that, that populate our country and the world in which we are endeavoring to live out this gospel are incredible. Sometimes it's not the demons. Sometimes it's the rest of us church folk. I did a little check-in last week, last couple of weeks. I had a little bit of time, and so I started listening to the folk who were trying to figure out who was going to get to be the president of our country. That was a crazy deal. It's still crazy. But see, I never stopped and looked at it all. I had the opportunity to watch every day. I wondered, what in the world is that? It's quid, quid, I can't keep my teeth in now. Quid pro, that's it, bro. I, I thought, what does that mean? Well, I got enough of it and realized what it meant. It just was, a, as a statement, it means, let me make sure I just give you enough of it, okay? By, as a statement, it means, you helped me and it was off the side and done, and this is what we're doing. If you helped me with this, I'll help you with that. The church is 
churches aren't carried along like that when a successful it isn't a matter of sitting at a desk somewhere in somebody's sanctuary and seeing who's going to be the leaders this next year it isn't that we're not chosen like that we're called anybody seated here tonight who spent most of their life being called of God that works from the heart from the heart when I got through with watching some of this stuff and listening to so much thing I tell you it is a dangerous world we're living in too and the danger starts at the cusp of the president and the other leaders position we need to be praying about who we're going to support in election because that's going to decide who gets to lead God help us God help us. I haven't got to the first point yet, but I'm going to get there. The wind blows. That's how it's going to start. The wind blows. That bare, simple statement affirms the ceaseless action of the Spirit. This is amazing. I love that part. So we'll leave it lay there and see if I can get out of that to the next part as we go. I think there probably have been times when people have lamented that God had deserted his creation and felt like he had. You think so? People say they do. I don't know. I've, I've never even gotten bold enough yet to, to gripe at God about things. You know, kind of fuss about him. I, I didn't think I ever really had freedom to do that. This is God the Creator. Could I introduce him to you? Here's God the Creator. Uh, what would you like to say to him today? When he leaves here, he's going to leave like a ball of fire. He's going to leave with every awareness of who you are. He's going to leave ready to help you or not. <clears throat> but I think there have been times when we felt like God deserted his creation or is doing something else till we get there. So that's why the Baal people came up. We, did we get all that done? I think so. Cry aloud for he is a God. This is what, this is what is said to the Baal on the mountain. Deserted his creation, left it to us. We're confused, corrupt times when in faith eclipse of things Elijah's words cry aloud for he is a God either he is musing or he is on a journey or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened now would that be a, would that be a cry for a child of God and a part of the kingdom of God where his people are kept and used would that be no, it's not. It doesn't sound right. Got to a wrong God for one thing. God sits in heaven and does nothing, Thomas Carlyle said. Oh, I, won't, I don't want to introduce him when the time comes. I'd just give him a little space. H.G. Wells, in his last testament, many will know that name better, which he called Mind at the End of Its Tether, declared man to be played out, the world jaded, devoid of recuperative power. May have felt like that about our own lives occasionally, but what is the bless where is the blessedness of I that I knew when I first saw the Lord and embraced His work in me? Where is the blessedness? My soul is at the end of the tether. I have nothing to show but the shabby rags and tatters of my mistakes. There is no rebirth nor refreshing anywhere for me. That's what we'd be complaining about all the time. Some are feeling like that about the church. Where is the hope of revival? Now, listen to the wind. Nicodemus, listen to the wind. This I thought about this week, too. The church is not in trouble. 
I know we say that. We gripe about it. We say things about this. The church is just not going to be held up. Who's doing the praying? Who's doing the preaching? Who's doing the believing? Who's crying out to God every day with the knowledge that this God hears me when I cry out to him? We know who he is. He's the one who found us. Some of us he found in the barn on the farm. Others found in different little places all the time. Some of us, he carved us right out of the junk around us and said, come my son, I'll make you a fisher of men, a man of God. No, the church is okay. It's we who are trying to sustain it that are off the track a little. Where's the hope of revival, they asked. And the response to that was, listen to the wind. The music of the dawn wind. Listen to the wind. You ever thought about what God was thinking and feeling and the people that draw near to him all the time, what they were thinking and feeling when that dawn wind of resurrection day showed up. That dawn wind came through. R for Pentecost, where the power of the Spirit drove the message deep into the heart of those who waited. You know, if you go out tonight, a beautiful, beautiful moon out there night before last. I went in the house, got gray, said, come look at the moon. You might get a kiss if you get a moon. You know what I mean? You might just do that. It's dark, too. So you don't have to worry about the neighbor 10 miles away to see her. So we got, we got the kiss. We got the look. And it was fun. It was good. And the beauty in that moon was pretty, it's a mixture of colors. I don't know exactly how it got there, but it was, it was beautiful. Thanks, God, Father. Thank you. You did have the time, didn't you? You did want to love on us, didn't you? Wow. You love us. Incredible. He does. In the blackest night, if we open the windows and listen, we'll hear the wind. And know that God is stirring, never slumbering, never resting, never desisting, from his work, never. Always providential, always redemptive. And his cosmic patience is the salvation of the world. He's still gathering us up. Wow. The second wind blows where he just sees it, where it blows. If the first affirmation was the ceaseless action of the Spirit, which is what we kind of put down on the first line, this is the sovereign freedom of the Spirit. Unceasing and sovereign. That's a pretty good matchup. But that's, that's a potent, powerful connection between two who belong to him. Just as it is impossible for us to control the wind or dictate to its direction, so no man, no church can domesticate the Spirit of God or limit it. His sphere of operation accomplishes his work. This old sphere of God. The institutional religion is, is a thing that I hear people talking about nowadays. When I first got involved in the church and was a, just a teenager, that wasn't a question. Everybody realized that there was a church already in place. You don't build new organizational churches and great big things and leave the starting gate where you left the apostles, prophets and others. And so we come along now, we got so many choices. If it's not right, we pound the red button, out! 
And every time it's defined, I noticed lately it's defined by a certain part of a creed or a text or a relationship that has to do with how much money will we have to spend by the time the year's out to reach the world. I think we're going at it the wrong way with that statement, but he sends us out to live among people. That's how it works in the world. You say, well, all I've got is neighbors and apartments. Well, you've got a lot more than probably I have. I have one big old buck deer and a house. It's great. If it's my nature, fine. I have to walk off the place to run into a sinner. Well, not counting me, you know. Affirmation, freedom of the spirit. This is the area where grace is valid, where the church and its races, I say races because there's a mixture of people most of the time now when we do what we're doing. But God is forever upsetting those neat logical schemes and discomfiting our tidy regulations, watching how it happens. Judeum said, Judeum said, Judaism, we are the covenant people. That's how they see themselves, saw themselves. We are the covenant people. We will have no truck with Gentiles and barbarians and lesser breeds without the law. Law is going to be the working thing here. And they stood there doggedly. You know, they have this ready to wait and get it right. Built, built high and strong, their wall to partition and division. And then one day out of the darkness of Camp and Mount Calvary, Mount Calvary, from the red dawn of an empty tomb, there arose a great wind of the Spirit that battered that wall and leveled it to the dust. With a crash that startled the world, the wall of exclusion went down like matchwood before the, the gale of Pentecost. There are men working today behind the scenes in many places to build anew and afresh our things we believe with their defining walls. Policies of segregation and monopolies of grace get mixed up together some places in our world. Beware so that love is not pushed aside, forgotten. See what God is really doing when you're preparing to get involved or leap. I lived, when I was growing up, my, my only place of residence, I lived there from the time I was born until we all were moving out for directions. And I loved the farm. I thought it was too much work, but I had the right to do that. I was 14, 15, 13, 12. We were working with our father, so there wasn't any kind of remuneration laid out on the table. See that plate on the table, boy? Oh, you mean that steak? Because oftentimes it was. We raised our beef, so we had plenty of beef, a lot of deer, a lot of squirrel. Those were mine. Mine to take for the family head. But we lost a lot of simplicity as we kept living deeper into the multitudes that are trying to figure life out. And somehow, I think a local church can quit trying to be the biggest church in town and start again by turning toward Jesus and a place for your knees. Now, I'm talking to me too. Place for your knees, place for prayer. It doesn't have to be seen by anybody but Him because he knows and he sees and he works it. I remember when we first did those kind of things at church by simply kind of taking them and sitting them down and saying, listen, we're having, we're having this prayer and it's for repentance and we're anticipating God working in our neighbor and in us. So this is what you do. We're going to do it for 30 minutes. Stay put. Now that is a long time for a kid. 
So we upped the ante. And when I was pastoring that home church of mine, I brought it up to where we had come and pray an hour. Everybody come and pray an hour, you know. But we prayed and God came. I could not believe that he came with such grace and such power. All we were doing were praying, it got louder. And you knew as you walked around and prayed, I was the pastor, I was to do that. Lay hand on a shoulder and ask God's amazing grace, a touch, a healing. It was an amazing time. I wish it could have lasted a lot longer. And I can't ask now for the same thing again. You can't just go and ask for a repeat of what's been. It's going to take again a pursuit of God. So that you can't step into the bracket when you want to. You've got to get your heart ready and then go down with the rest of the people and lay on the floor and get it right. You know, God's got this wonderful plan working and he mixes up in his holiness and all of this that we can see from him as he gives it. What he mixes into this whole bit of work by God is the carpenter's bench and wayside gallows. Carpenter's bench and wayside hanging rack. Gallows. What is that? God built his church in the middle of the opposition. He built his church in the face of God's working, this miraculous work in his people. Even when John and Charles Wesley had been involved in those great revivals in Europe. You know that there was a time when it was just going every day. You could go preach as long as far as they could hear you. They'd stand to be heard as you preached to the people out there. Wayside gallows, appallingly unphilosophical. And these guys were pretty smart. The Wesleys were not uneducated. They weren't. But they were just defying the opposition of God's. Defying the opposition of a God who was helping them, not getting rid of them. And Jesus, coming through all of that, had built this place where we could come. And Jesus came and revealed was revealed to us as a resident of Nazareth. Not a very beautiful place. Not a guy with great ratings for people to have houses and getaway places. Heresy was preached there sometime. But God's people always prevailed. He was doing it. Here's what happened, and then we're done. That's Christ finished. Someone came along and saw Jesus Christ's gallow. It was time to die, and he was taken out to the place where he expected to die and did. Dying there as the people passed by and looked and mocked and made fun of him. That's Jesus Christ finished, somebody said. This dead and defeated man will trouble us no more. Think so? Let him sleep behind the stone forever. Suddenly came the wind of heaven and burst the tomb and Christ went conquering the world. Don't try to tame the intractable wind. It's hard. It fights you. No act of convocation or assembly can circumscribe it. No arrogant political dictator curb it. No rooted personal prejudice patronage for him, for God seeing in himself. It is master of the world, we'll call him. He masters it, all of it. In Jesus' name. This is the sovereign freedom of the Holy Spirit. There is no citadel of self and sin that is safe from him. No unbelieving cynic secure beyond his reach. There is no ironclad bastion 
of theological self-confidence that is immune, no impregnable agnosticism. He cannot disturb into faith. No disturbing into faith. No ancient ecclesiastical animosities. He cannot reconcile. And blessed be his name, there is no winter death of the soul that he cannot quicken into a blossoming springtime of life. No dry bones he cannot vitalize into a marching army. This is the glory of Pentecost. The wind blows where it wills. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. The voice, the call has to be drawn in by God. He'll do that. If it's two of us, if it's three of us, if it's one of us, he will be there to make it plural. We will be there stumbling maybe, not able to say things the way we'd like to, and I can identify with that. But knowing that he is at work. He is at work unceasingly receiving praise. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your faithful love to us. I want to thank you for caring for your people, bringing them toward that place where prayer is opened up before God. Lord, let us not complain or fuss or say we can't or back off in a way. Let us find our way in Christ Jesus as he opens the doors for us. Let us, O oh Lord, have the gumption to pray for each of us as we pray. Let us believe along the way that somehow those who walk with us and beside us are going to find in us, with them, a people of prayer, people of confident trust. Your name be praised, O oh Lord. Bless your people as we go out. Bless them as we live out there as we come again to worship, as we go out again to serve, as we come in again to worship, as we go out and just to praise your name. Your will be done. Receive our praise as we sing. Let us acknowledge God's blessed presence. Amen.
might go ahead and give it. Okay. Um, reminder about pictures you have today plus five more Sundays that we'll do the portraits. So please be sure and sign up or if you want to do them today, meet me in the foyer. I have a couple of people already signed up, but I'll take anybody else who wants to, to uh, come get theirs done also. Um, also, I need to know by show of hands, if you will, who will be here for the meal th for the luncheon Thursday? Because Royanne is preparing food, we need to have a, a head count if possible. So, behind you. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Got it done. Yes, sir. Good. We need a. <clears throat> we're having another um, art show. Uh, here in our building, so that's going to be coming up. What is it next week? Next week, not this week after. Yeah, I'll look at the map again. Right away. Have you heard from uh, Ken or any of those guys? Me, I haven't heard anything either. So. But if you, some of you men can help us, all these chairs will have to come out. And what I'm going to do is mark them sooner this time, so that the green little sticker in there where the chair, set, chair sets is still going to be there when we get through moving them about. Uh, we'll be able to get to church a lot sooner if we are able to put that together a lot quicker. So anybody want to help, just know that we're, pro we're going to be beginning uh, Friday morning and uh, a week from, or is it a week from? Okay, week from. Not next Friday. No, that's right, not next Friday. We've got it. Whoever's involved has it, right? All right. Well, let's, uh, let's lift our hands high to the Lord. I give, him, I give him praise today. I've not been able to finish sentences like that for months and to be able to say what my heart was saying. And I appreciate, I appreciate the Lord's faithfulness. Thank you. He gets all that credit. And I get to celebrate it, so that's a good thing. Thank you for being here. It's a, for me, it's a great day, a good day. May the Lord bless us together. Father, I want to thank you for my brothers and my sisters. I want to thank you for men and women of God who will hear the Word of God and respond to it, who will walk with you and live in attentive, in attentive ways in order to be involved with what you're doing. So bless each one, each life, each family. Keep us this week and give us an opportunity, Lord, to bear witness to others. And let it be witness saturated with sweet, sweet love from Jesus Christ our Lord. Have your way in us. Your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.